Okay. So good morning, everyone. So we have a pretty okay number to start. So two offline and 14 online. So our today's speaker is uh, Dr. Srihar Tendulkar, who is currently working at TIFR uh, and NCRA as a joint uh, reader. And he joined uh, in 2020. And uh, Dr. Srihals is very uh, well known working in FRB, obviously uh, radio transients. He completed his graduation. He did BTEC from IIT Mumbai in 2008. Then after that, he moved to USA, Caltech, for his MS and PhD, uh, which was in astrophysics, basically. And after that, he uh, did his postdocs from Caltech and uh, McGill. And after that, in 2020, he joined uh, this joint position at TIFR Mumbai and NCRA Pune. So I will not um, waste much of your time. So I will request Srihars to share his screen and uh, please start the presentation. Thank you, Srihar. Thank you, Sareel. Um, thank you, everyone, for the invitation to talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to a great discussion. So let me share my screen. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So hi, everyone. I'm going to be telling you about some of the new recent results from uh, past radio bursts and the lessons we have learned from uh, Chime FRB, which is this beautiful telescope in my background picture. Um, till now, I used to call FRBs as a in, as a field in its infancy. Uh, you know, it was it's fairly recent. These transients are something we discovered only about a decade ago. But now I think it has come into its teenage years. Uh, every day there is some new mood. Every new result changes our understanding of FRBs completely, and hence we are all completely confused. But uh, I'm going to try to give you a sense of what we think, uh, what we think FRBs are, where we think they're coming from, and where this field is going. Towards the end, I will highlight some of the future efforts that are going on and uh, showcase some of the new pilot projects that we are doing with Chime FRB as well as uh, new things in India. So clearly, to make an uh, instrument as big as Chime, we need a lot of people. And there is this, this fantastic team across McGill, University of British Columbia, University of Toronto, and all across Canada and US. And there's a growing group of people at uh, TIFR as well as uh, NCRA who are joining the uh, Chime uh, collaboration. And some of the results I'm going to show are also from our collaborators in the European VLBI network. I see Benito and Franz are already here. That's great. So let me talk about fast radio bursts. Uh, as this animation shows, if your eyes were sensitive to radio light and you looked up at the sky, you might see bright flashes of light coming from random directions in the sky. They last only for a thousandth of a second. And some, and some of them are really bright. Uh, they can be as bright as cell phone signals, except that they're not coming from a cell phone tower 10 kilometers away. They're coming from halfway across the universe. And they, there aren't a few of them. There are a thousand FRBs every day at detectable thresholds in the entire sky. Okay, But we had simply not seen FRBs till about 2007. And one of the reasons why we did not detect them is, is the dispersion measure. They're highly dispersed. And I'll talk about that in this slide. This is, the dispersion measure is also the reason why we, uh, why we believed in, in the beginning that FRBs were extragalactic which was later confirmed with uh, localizations of FRBs to host galaxies. Now, as radio waves traverse through the interstellar medium, they don't all travel at the same speed. High frequency radio waves travel faster than low frequency radio waves. And this uh, arrival time delay is very precisely known. It goes as a constant multiplied by frequency raised to minus two. Uh, so you can see this uh, dynamic spectrum in the plot on the right, it shows the intensity in the color bar as a function of frequency on the vertical axis going from about 1200 megahertz to 1500 megahertz and time on the horizontal axis. And you can see that the burst arrives earlier at high frequencies and arrives later at low frequencies. And the total magnitude of this uh, difference 
is given by what is known as the dispersion measure, the DM. And that is simply the integral of the electron density along the line of sight from the source to the observer. Now, there are two things to, two important things to know about the DM. The first, first is that the DM is not a priori known. We have to search over, a over different dispersion, prior dispersion measures. So the way an FRB search works is that you assume a dispersion measure and you integrate this intensity across frequency to get what is the time profile. And you you'll search the time profile for a particular burst. And only if you have the correct dispersion measure will you see a burst. Otherwise, this burst is going to get completely smeared out. So this becomes a computationally expensive search and people avoided searching extremely high DMs because uh, in, even in pulsar searches because we didn't we simply did not have the computational ability to do that and we didn't think anything could be bright enough to be seen from extragalactic distances. The other thing is that these dispersion measures, if you understand uh, the NE part of this equation and you have an understanding of electron density in different parts of the universe, you can use that as a proxy for distance. So this is what this this was our first clue that FRBs might be coming from extragalactic distances. We have models of the electron distribution in our galaxy. This is the Yao Manchester and Wang model. This is sort of the top down view of the Milky Way and it shows you the electron density in different colors. So this is the center of the Milky Way. We are somewhere here about eight kiloparsecs to the north. And if you give me a line of sight uh, through this three dimensional model, you can integrate the electron density and ask what is the maximum dispersion measure that the Milky Way can contribute. And there is a limit to it. There is a very nice envelope to the maximum dispersion measure that the Milky Way can contribute. And that's shown by this plot on the right hand side. So here I'm plotting the dispersion measure on the vertical axis and uh, the galactic latitude going from minus 90, which is the galactic south pole to zero in the middle, which is the galactic equator and uh, plus 90 in the on the right hand side, which is the galactic north pole. The blue dots here are uh, galactic pulsars and there are some uh, green and yellow dots which are from the small and large Magellanic clouds but you can see that the blue dots follow this very nice envelope uh, which is the limit which is the limit of the galaxy and you can see that all the frbs which are shown by red circles have far higher dms for the same galactic latitude than the than the galaxy could have contributed and this excess dm has to come from somewhere we have made uh, deep H alpha and continuum radio observations that rule out any local emission of uh, any local source of DM right around the FRBs. So eventually it turned out that these are uh, quite far away. And eventually we were able to actually localize FRBs and find the host galaxies measure the redshifts. And it does turn out that FRBs are coming to us from few gigaparsec to few gigaparsec distances. In fact, except there are a couple which are really nearby and I will uh, briefly mention them later. The first FRB that was uh, ever localized was this FRB, repeating FRB 121102. So it was initially, when it was initially found with the Arecibo Observatory, we had uh, error regions which are the same size as the Arecibo beam, which is about three arc minutes, which is about this big. And with, with the VLA, we were able to pinpoint that the FRB came from this particular spot, which, ha which has an optical host galaxy and a persistent radio source at a redshift of 0.2. We'll talk about that later. At this point, there are about a dozen FRBs which have been localized and every day there are new FRBs which are coming up. One thing I would really like to highlight is uh, a recent result from uh, Franz Piston and Benito Marcote and uh, the rest of us. We found the FRB in a globular cluster in M81, which this is, firstly, it is an old stellar population, which is very weird. And it is a 3.6 megaparsec away, which is practically in, in our backyard. So this is a fantastic uh, FRB to follow up. I won't go into greater detail here, but if you, if anybody's interested, please feel free to ask questions later. So given that we have the distances, we can, try to figure out what the energetics are. We know the fluence, we know uh, the distance, so we can figure out what the luminosities are. And uh, we can try to understand what sort of processes can lead to FRBs. So this is a plot of luminosity on the vertical axis and time scale on the horizontal axis. And uh, you can see that FRBs are many orders of magnitude 
in uh, higher in luminosity than typical uh, pulsars or even giant pulses from crab and b0540 minus 69 so young pulsars so it turns out that frbs are far brighter and consequently their brightness temperature is far higher than uh, those of pulsars and clearly these have to be coherent emissions they cannot be uh, thermal emission and you have to figure out how to create this kind of power and we really don't have any theoretical way to scale up uh, the typical pulsar mechanism which we don't really understand very well either but we have a better idea of the pulsar mechanism after a couple of decades uh, we do, we don't have a good way of scaling them up to uh, you know 10 billion to a trillion times more lumin more luminosity so there are a lot of different models of frbs and um, people have tried to explain different aspects of them. There are three main components to it. One is, you know, you have a fuel which stores your energy for a long period of time because the FRB has to be active for a long period of time. And you can store your energy in the magnetic field, the rotational energy, the kinetic energy or gravitational potential. You also need an engine which sources the energy and it has to be able to extract this energy in a very short time scale because the FRB emission happens within a millisecond or so. So that has, that's a, that is something that constrains the engine. And so you have you can either have magnetic reconnection or magnetic acceleration or some sort of a relativistic shock that is emitted. And then you need to have some sort of a transmission which converts this extracted energy into electromagnetic radiation. So the two main things that have been proposed are the synchrotron radiation or the or curvature radiation. And you can mix and match these different scenarios in a variety of astrophysical setups. Right, so the most common and the most popular thing that is uh, discussed is some sort of a magnetic field reconnection on the surface or uh, on the outsides of a magnetar or some sort of a star quake kind of scenario. And you can also have binary neutron star mergers or coalescence of uh, a neutron star and a black hole. You could also possibly have interactions with winds or radiative shocks from, from OB stars or other pulsars or, or active galactic nuclei hitting a pulsar and there is this combed model where the magnetic field is combed. Uh, you can also have more exotic scenarios like axion nugget interacting with a magnetic field of a neutron star or a cosmic cusp leading to a particle of jets and then that cascades into electromagnetic radiation. So there are all these different scenarios and what we want to figure out is whether uh, which which of these are feasible models and which of these actually operate. Now, note one thing here, um, if you have a FRB being emitted by a merger, that merger is not going to happen again. So it's a cataclysmic event and it's going to lead to an FRB that happens exactly once. However, there are uh, many, many FRBs that seem to repeat. They come, they show repeating, uh, repeat, repeated bursts over uh, many years. And so th those kinds of uh, observations rule out mergers in the in that scenario. So we want to understand whether these F repeaters and non-repeaters are the same population or whether they are different populations. The, there have been long observations of some of these non-repeaters and we have never seen any burst from them. So you can ask the question, are they different populations? So I've drawn this very uh, cartoonish diagram with a population on the vertical axis and rate parameter on the horizontal axis. Um, and you have, you can, you might have something like this orange curve where you have a population of non-repeaters. They just happen once, and you'll never see them again ever. Or you can have, and there's another population of repeaters which seem to have a certain range of repetition rates. Or you could have a, a population like the green one where you have repeaters are, you know, uh, uh, one end of the one end of this population which seem to repeat quite frequently. And the non-repeaters may still repeat, but they might repeat, say, once a decade or once a century, and we'll never, we'll never know because we have been observing only for the past five years or so. So when we say that things are non-repeaters, we just mean that we haven't seen them to repeat yet. They might repeat after a while. We don't know that. But even independent of whether they're repeaters or non-repeaters, given that FRBs are coming from cosmological distances, they have a great potential to serve as cosmological probes. So these are polarized uh, radio waves, which are interacting with every magnetic field and every electron that they encounter from the source to the earth. And 
because of this, they're incredibly sensitive to turbulence, baryon distributions in the universe, and so on. So you can use them to trace, for example, uh, the missing baryon problem. You can try to understand the he understand helium to reionization at redshift three, and so on. You can also uh, study Faraday rotation and uh, the magnetic fields around the FRB source as well as uh, distributed throughout the universe. And the holy grail of uh, FRBs, for example, would be detecting a strongly lensed uh, FRB. If you have a repeating FRB that is strongly lensed, you can actually study time delay differences to extreme precision. You, can, you have precisions of you know, microseconds across a billion years. So that would be fantastic. You can actually, you have the capability of measuring the Hubble constant change over a, over a period of a few years. That would be really great, except that it's extremely rare as well. So there are a lot of questions we would like to answer about FRBs. We don't understand them, even though we, we have dreams of using them as cosmological probes. But if you want to understand what properties of FRBs are intrinsic, what properties are caused due to um, the propagation effects and other properties that we would like to study in the volume of the universe, we need to ask a lot of questions. So what are FRBs? What, how many are there different types of FRBs? How many types? Do all of them repeat at some, some rate? You would also like to understand what is the sky rate? What is the volumetric rate? What, are the, what is the energy distribution and so on? And to answer these questions, the best possible way you can do this is with a large uh, population of FRBs, which are selected with, a well -understood, with, with well understood biases. And with that, we, tried, we decided to build Chime FRB. That was the goal of setting up Chime FRB. So let me tell you a little bit about Chime and the uh, instrument that we use. Chime stands for the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. And as the name suggests, it was built for mapping uh, atomic hydrogen and studying baryon acoustic oscillations in a redshift range of 0.8 to 2.5. So it is made with the aim of just mapping a huge swath of the sky. So Chime consists of four cylinders, uh, which are fixed in the ground. They just look straight up at the zenith. They, they are about 20 meters wide and 100 meters long, aligned in the north-south direction. And you can see this focal line, which is actually a walkway over which our team is standing. And underneath this focal line, there are 256 dual polarization fields, which operate from 400 to 800 megahertz on each cylinder. That gives it a field of view, which is about two and a half degrees wide in the east-west direction and about 100 degrees long in the north-south direction. And that gives it a total field of view of about 250 square degrees, which is a huge field of view compared to any other uh, radio telescope in the sky. Now that is what leads Chime to detect a lot of FRBs. And I'm just showing you a couple of photos of all the skills that we uh, developed while building Chime. This is, Chime was built uh, by emeritus professors, professors, postdocs, graduate students, and undergrads, all of them working uh, uh, with their hands to get it up and running. And Chime, the way Chime operates is quite unique. It is a transit telescope. So Chime doesn't point anywhere. The sky just drifts through it. So here I'm showing you the radio sky at about 400 megahertz from the Hustler Metal map. And uh, the inner circle shows the horizon at Chime. These, four, these beams are what Chime sees. So Chime uh, basically makes 1024 interferometric beams from the 1024 antenna feeds that it has. And they are uh, arranged four across and 256 long. And for each beam, we get one millisecond time sampled intensity streams, which has, uh, which has 16,384 frequency channels across uh, 400 megahertz. So this is in fact equivalent to uh, 1024 green bank telescopes operating at the same time. It's about the same sensitivity and it has uh, a mapping speed, which is thousand times more than the GBT. And the data rate which we get from this is insane. We get 130 gigabits per second of intensity data that has to be searched for FRBs in real time. And if we detect an FRB for the bright ones, we can go back and save the raw voltage data from each antenna and that is about 800 gigabytes per second. So we, we store only a very small sliver of that, about 100 milliseconds or so. And with that, we are able to detect a lot of FRBs. So I'll just give you a brief history of what, what we have detected with Chime. So Chime uh, had the first detection of FRBs at 400 megahertz 
uh, when we built it, we did not know that FRBs could could show up at that that low frequency. We also had uh, 70 new repeating FRBs. There are about 50 50 odd repeating FRBs which are being published right now. We are still working on cataloging all of them and confirming them. We also had uh, the detection of periodic activity with a period of 16.35 days uh, in this FRB 180916, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And uh, a galactic FRB from SGR 1935, which has a multi, which was the first one which had a multi wavelength counterpart, an X ray burst as well. And there are uh, many other galactic rotating radio transients and binary pulsars that were discovered. We discovered an uh, discovered a repeating FRB in M81 at 3.6 megaparsec. And there are uh, more paper, there are a lot more papers that have uh, been published related to these uh, results over the past year. We also published the first catalog of FRBs uh, last year, uh, earlier this year, late last year. And uh, we had, we discussed the FRB morphology, the scattering properties of FRBs and the galactic distribution and the cross correlation of FRBs with gal galactic catalogs. So today I'm going to talk only about the first three of these results. There are, uh, I'm not going to talk about ga the galactic distribution of FRBs and the cross correlation of FRBs with galaxy catalogs. That is something you can uh, read up on if you are interested. They're really interesting results. So today my focus will be on the first uh, three of these aspects. But before we move on to that, I would like to highlight a couple of really interesting peculiar FRBs, which have uh, led to substantial changes in our understanding of FRBs themselves. So the first FRB, which was localized was FRB 12.11.02, and it shaped a lot of our understanding of FRBs and the theoretical progress that was made. So most FRBs even now are localized to a few arc minutes. So you can see that there are these large error, error regions. Chime localizes to order of 10 to 15 arc minutes most of the time. And there are a lot of optical galaxies in this region, obviously, even there are even a lot of radio sources. This, uh, this image is from the VLA and it shows all the radio sources in that region. When we went back to uh, this local location with the Jansky VLA, we were able to localize the FRB itself to, and it was co-located with this very bright persistent radio source and a dwarf optical galaxy. Now you could ask if FRBs come from, you know, young neutron stars and magnetars, why is this FRB in a dwarf galaxy, which is 10,000 times less massive and possible and likely has 10,000 times fewer neutron stars than the Milky Way. And one of the clues was, is that low metallicity is also associated with hosts of long GRBs and superluminous supernovae, which require the low metallicities to form extremely massive stars. And that gives this gives rise to this millisecond magnetar model where you have uh, a long GRB or a superluminous supernova, which is powered by a millisecond magnetar. And over after a couple of decades, uh, when the debris around it clears out, you, the same magnetar can also produce flares that would generate FRBs. So this was a model uh, put forth by Brian Metzger, Ben Margalit, and other their other collaborators. And this also explains the persistent radio source, which would be a, a pulsar wind nebula or, or something like that. But this didn't last for very long because when we found another repeater, which was localized uh, to a galaxy at 150 megaparsec, it turns out this galaxy is completely different. It's a very Milky Way like galaxy. You can see this very nice spiral arm and so on. And there is no persistent radio source at this location, despite deep observations. And what, so clearly the model which was put forth for FRB 12.11.02 doesn't obviously work for uh, other repeaters. There are, you know, you could tweak the model, but it doesn't work uh, out of the box. So then there are other, aspects about these repeaters that are puzzling. One of the aspects is that there is, we found that the, the bursts coming from FRB 180916 are periodic. So if you observe, take a periodogram of the bursts observed by Chime, you can see that there is a, uh, there is a significant periodicity at 16.35 days and it's harmonics. And if you look at the same location, look at a pulsar at the same declination, for example, 
you see there is no periodicity, which means that this is not an instrumental effect. This is something intrinsic to the FRB itself. And if you, it turns out that these bursts are coming in a short window of about three to four days, every 16 and a half days. And the bursts themselves are not periodic. The duty cycle is not 100%, but the periodic window is very, very clear. And then you can ask, what is this time scale? This 16.35 day time scale, is it rotation? Is it orbit? Is it precession? Is there another underlying periodicity? And after a while, it turned out that the first repeating FRB, FRB 121102, was also found to be periodic. But at this point, it had a 160 day period. So it is really hard to explain this really long period with either as a rotation or precession of a isolated magnetar. But it is quite natural to consider it to be a orbital period, especially of high mass X-ray binaries. And with, there is another clue that leads us to think about this. Uh, this is an, uh, an Hubble image of the FRB uh, 180916 field. And you can see that the, the FRB is local, localized to a very high precision with VLBI, thanks to uh, Franz and Benito and the European VLBI network. And so this green circle shows you the error that shows you the 36 milliarc second error radius of the VLBI plus the astrometric uh, registration error and so on. And you can see that the FRB is actually offset from the star forming region by about 250 parsec. There is a similar offset seeing the first repeater as well of about 200 to 300 parsec from its nearest star forming region. Now, why is this important? because magnetars are very young. Their characteristic ages are less than 10,000 years. And typically they are found very, very close to the star forming regions in which they were formed. And the scale height for magnetars in our own galaxy, for example, is about 30 to 40 parsec. So it would be really hard for a magnetar to stay active for so long while it is, being, while it is traveling away from its uh, place of birth. So this, this kind of offset is more typical of X-ray binaries, which have, a, or which have a galactic scale height of about 400 parsec. So one possible way to think about this is that these, uh, repeat, these repetitions are caused due to the orbital period of the magnetar uh, of the uh, system and not due to a rotational period of a magnetar. The other really cool FRB that happened, well, I put it FRB in quotes because it wasn't as luminous as normal FRBs, but this was the brightest uh, radio event which was ever de detected in our skies. So there is this magnetar SGR 1935 plus 2154, which had been active since November 2019. There were bursts and X-ray flares and all sorts of things. And on 28th of April 2020, we detected incredibly bright Megajansky flare in the radio. So you can see this image on the left, that's from the Chime uh, telescope. And this magnetar was about 30 degrees away from the prime meridian, so it was but it was still incredibly bright. And uh, it, was at, it was detected at the same time by STAIR-2 as well, which is a small uh, 1.4 gigahertz dish, which is pointed to the sky uh, in California. And this is also meant to detect extremely bright flares. It was also detected by a 10 meter dish in Algonquin, which is about 3000 kilometers away. And this burst came from this galactic magnetar. So we, this, now we know that this, that FRB like bursts can come from canonical magnetars as we know them, but it was still on the lower side of the luminosity. So this plot here shows the observed fluence of different transients uh, as a function of uh, the distance from us. And these hot diagonal lines are lines of constant energetics. So you have, you have the crab pulsar somewhere over here, you have rest of our rats and you have the whole range of crab giant pulses. You have SGR 1935 here, which is by far the brightest event which you have ever detected. And you have all the FRBs, which we know of somewhere around here. And you can see that if you, if you go along the line of constant energy, the magnetar is still slightly fainter, slightly less luminous than the typical FRB, but nonetheless, it is far brighter than anything we have ever seen from most uh, galactic pulsars. What is also incredible is that this FRB was accompanied by multi by a multi counterpart. Then this is the first time it has happened. So there was an X-ray flare which was detected right at the same time. And it had three peaks, two of which 
very closely aligned with the radio, which is shown in uh, orange here. And you can actually measure very precisely what the delay is between the radio and the X-rays. And it turns out that the radio did come before the X-rays, which suggests that uh, the magnetic reconnection, it, it was more like a magnetic reconnection event than a synchrotron radiation, synchrotron radiation event, in which case you would expect both of these to come right at the same time. But we don't know why this particular burst had an X-ray counterpart and why not the others. There have been many other X-ray bursts without radio, and there have been many other radio bursts without X-rays, and we have not seen such an event ever since. So you might ask the question, does that solve all our problems? Can magnetars be explain all FRBs? In terms of occurrence rate, yes, it is sort of consistent with the volumetric rate of uh, FRBs. But, more, but magnetars like SGR 1935 don't likely explain all FRBs because the behavior we have seen from individual FRBs uh, is simply not replicated by SGR 1935 or, or any of the other magnetars that we have ever seen. It's a huge difference between the, energy, the energetics between regular FRBs and magnetars. So with that, let me come to the catalog and the population and the understanding of the population of FRBs. So this is the first Chime FRB catalog where, where we had 535 FRBs characterized between July 2018 and July 2019. And this shows the distribution of FRBs on the sky. The blue ones are as yet single FRBs, so the non quote unquote non-repeating FRBs. And the triangles are the repeating FRBs. And because Chime is a transit instrument, we have a very large range of exposure on these FRBs. So uh, if you go towards the southern declinations, you have a lower uh, exposure. So each part of the sky is exposed only for a couple of hours over, a, over the full year. And if you go to the North Pole, because it is circumpolar, you have almost 2000 hours of exposure. So you might ask the question, if, if, if repeating and non-repeating FRBs are a part of the same distribution or they are different distributions, you might expect to see more repeaters with more exposure as we observe for longer, more and more FRBs will turn out to be repeaters or not. So you can ask, is the de declination distribution of repeaters and non-repeaters consistent? And it turns out as of right now, they, they are. So this is uh, a plot of the right ascension and the declination of repeaters and uh, non-repeaters. The non-repeaters are in the blue and they're a lot more numerous. And you have the repeaters in the in orange. It turns out you, if you do a KS test between them, they are essentially identical. You can also do an, you can also ask the question, are repeaters nearer or are they necessarily brighter? Are they detected with a higher SNR? And you can do the same kind of a uh, comparison between repeating and non-repeating FRBs and they turn out to be identical as of right now. The only thing that seems to be completely different between repeaters and non-repeaters seems to be the width and the bandwidth. So if you measure the width of uh, pulses of repeaters and of non-repeaters and the bandwidth over which they are seen, they seem to be completely different. So these are numbers, these are chance coincidence numbers from uh, Anderson Darling and KS Tess. And it turns out that these two distributions are completely different. And I'll talk a lot more about that later uh, when I show Ziggy Plunis's work on FRB morphology. But first, let me talk about the distribution of FRBs themselves and the, uh, the rate of FRBs. So to measure the biases of CHIME and to correct our catalog for the biases, we had to uh, do a lot of injection. We did about 85, we injected about 85,000 uh, FRBs into the CHIME system with a whole range of dispersion measures, widths, fluences, scattering. And what we get is the selection function. We get a probability of detection as a, as a six dimension, as a function of six dimensions. And this plot in, uh, in black here shows this selection function as a function of dispersion measure on the horizontal axis. And the vertical uh, normalization is slightly arbitrary here. Don't worry about it. But what you see here is that uh, we are fairly sensitive to FRBs all over the place or from dispersion measures of 100 up to dispersion measures of 5,000 or so. And then you can look at the uh, raw catalog, that's the blue histogram, and the uh, 
fiducial model multiplied by the selection function. On the right hand side, it's the same plot, except now uh, the, the catalog, the histogram has been corrected for selection and the model is as observed on the sky. Now you can use this uh, to figure out what is the actual rate of FRBs on the sky, given the FR rate of FRBs detected by Chime. But one of the things you notice is that we are not, we are not very sense we are not detecting too many FRBs above a DM of 2000 uh, parsec per cubic centimeter. So right about here, we are sensitive to those, but we are not detecting FRBs at all. And the reason we think this is, is that we are reaching the energy limit of FRBs at this point. We are probably not sensitive enough to see FRBs from those distances. Now we can also use this uh, injections to look at the beam corrected rate and the power law index. So we can uh, do a two dimensional fit and figure out that the rate of FRBs on sky is about 800 per sky per day above a fluence Jansky of fluence of five Jansky milliseconds at 600 megahertz. And we can calculate the power law index of the log n log s slope. And that, it, that turns out to be about uh, consistent with minus 1.5, which is the Euclidean value. But we notice that if you split the, split the data set into low DM and high DM FRBs, it is much steeper at high DM, which is another clue that we are reaching the edge of the luminosity function of FRBs. Now, let me talk about the morphology of FRBs and the differences between repeaters and non repeaters. If you look at, if you just look at the catalog, you can see that there are FRBs of all shapes and sizes. Some of them are single component. They have a very nice scattering tail. Some of them seem to uh, go across the entire band. Some of them uh, seem to be fairly narrow banded. You can detect them only in a certain frequency band. Other FRBs seem to have multiple components. You can see a lot of different FRBs here. Some of them seem to be fairly extremely narrow band and short and squat. So we want to understand what the, these differences are and whether we can quantify them. And anecdotally, we had known that typically non-repeating FRBs would have these single component broadband bursts, whereas repeating FRBs would have all sorts of weird bursts. Sometimes you have single component narrow band bursts. Sometimes you have this down drifting, downward drifting uh, multiple components uh, like this type four FRB, which we used to call the sad trombone effect. And we did, we had known this anecdotally, but it had never been studied statistically. Now with this Chime FRB sample, we were able to do a study it in a lot more detail and actually quantify what this effect is. So one of our student, then students, now postdoc Ziggy Plunis, uh, did this fitting of FRBs where he measured the intrinsic width. So on the horizontal axis, you have extremely narrow pulses to the left and extremely broad pulses to the right. And you can fit a parameter called spectral running to the spectrum, where if you have uh, a spectral running of close to zero, then you have a more power law like spectrum, which is broadband. Whereas if you have a very negative number, then you have a more Gaussian like spectrum. So the upper part of this plot shows a broadband spectrum. The bottom part shows a narrower band Gaussian like spectrum. And the uh, green points here show the one, one of events, which are the non-repeaters and the per, and the orange points show the repeater bursts and to to make sure that we are not comparing apples to apples you can also plot simply the first detections of each repeater and it turns out uh, if you see the purple points they are also they also have the same distribution and you can plot the same kernel density uh, distributions uh, marginalized over spectral learning or marginalized over intrinsic width and they are completely different. So you can see that the green uh, histogram here is completely different from the purple and the orange histogram here. And the same applies for uh, the distribution with spectral running. In fact, if you look closely, there is a slight hump in the spectral running histogram uh, in the non in the one-off events, which indicates that some of these one-off events might turn out to be repeaters later. And indeed, over the past couple of years, we have seen that some of the events which showed up as non-repeaters in this catalog turned out to be uh, repeaters later. So the conclusion from this is that repeater bursts are temporally wider and spectrally narrow band. And you can also do this without the fitting. So you simply measure the bandwidth over which they are detectable 
and the duration over which they are detected. And you can compare the, this, these two parameters for one of events in the middle and the repeater bursts, and they're completely different. So the, but does this mean that repeaters and uh, non repeaters are coming from completely different astrophysical channels? And I would argue that they are not, they don't, we don't have that evidence yet. You could have morphology that changes with the repetition rate. You can imagine that there are rapid repeaters, which are maybe young magnetars and they have complex magnetic fields and complex bursts. Whereas there are old magnetars, which are rare repeaters and they, they have more simpler magnetic fields and simple bursts and so on. It could also be a propagation or a beaming effect where you have a, if you have a narrower beam, you have rarer repetition and you have simpler bursts. Whereas if you had a wider beam, then you might have more complex bursts and so on. So there are ongoing studies which where we are looking into the polarization differences, the rates and so on. And, but this could uh, help some of the repeater follow up. If you wanted to figure out, if you just wanted to find a lot of repeating FRBs, you can use these differences to figure out which are the best FRBs to follow up with other radio telescopes. Now let's talk, talk about the scattering. So we, we have seen a lot of FRBs that are highly scattered, except that our selection function says that we should not be sensitive to scattering uh, FR, scattered FRBs at all. So this is a plot of the scattering time scale and the selection function as a, pl a plot of the scattering time scale. And it turns out at about uh, 10 milliseconds or larger scattering times, we are not very sensitive. Our, uh, our selection criteria is very harsh over there. And we still detect FRBs, which means that the actual sky rate of these very broadened FRBs must be quite large. And it turns out it's really hard to explain these highly scattered FRBs. So one of our students, Pragya Chawla, she's now at uh, now postdoc, uh, simulated this uh, scattering function. So you build a universe, you populate it with galaxies of different types. You put in all the information we know about pulsars, magnetars, uh, Short, short GRBs and uh, all the understanding of the ISM, you know, you have the type of turbulence and the distributions we have in the Milky Way and so on. You simulate all the FRB populations and you ask that the observed BM distribution should be matched. And then you see what sort of scattering time distribution you would get. And it turns out that we really cannot get very high, uh, we, we really cannot get FRBs with a lot of scattering. And you need, you really need to have some excess source. So the, the conclusion here was that none of the models, whether it is FRBs uh, localized in the same way as pulsars or magnetars or short, short GRBs and so on seem to work. The only thing that seems to work reasonably is that FRBs have a host offset distribution like that of short GRBs to have the best fit, but that also needs additional sources of scattering like circumgalactic medium or extreme local environments. So the conclusion is that it's really hard to replicate the observed uh, scattering distribution. So it's either that FRBs are in extreme environments or we, or the, what we have assumed about other galaxies based on what we know about the Milky Way doesn't really work. So maybe other galaxies are different from what, what we have seen in the Milky Way. So with that, let me come to the outlook. What are we looking forward to? What we have learned from Chain is that detecting FRBs is not enough. Uh, we had to manually do a lot of the characterization of these FRBs for catalog one, and we can't keep that. It is not keep that up. It is not sustainable. So we are working hard on doing making automated pipelines for characterization, and so uh, and then using those to put out repeater paper three and catalog two. The other aspect which is really important is that we cannot simply detect an FRB and say, okay, it is somewhere there in the sky. We have to be able to pinpoint it. The localization uh, increases, the, increases the scientific value of an FRB by about one or two orders of magnitude. But VLBI telescopes are built for, for a small field of view. They cannot efficiently find non-repeating FRBs. So what we have been doing is building outrigger telescopes, which will have the same field of view as CHIME FRB. And we will be able to get 50 milli, milli arc second localization for every FRB repeater and non-repeater. And the, the aim is that every year over the next two years, we'll be able to get a thousand localized FRBs. So this is the location of CHIME in uh, Western Canada. And the outriggers are based in Algonquin, Green Bank, 
and there's a new outrigger being built in Hat Creek Observatory, just north of San Francisco. So this will give baselines of about 3,000 kilometers, which will uh, give fantastic localizations for all these FRBs. There is also there are also FRB VO events, uh, which are triggers, which are low latency real time triggers coming out from Chime FRB. We are we have recently made them public. So if anybody is interested in following up FRBs. You can subscribe to these. There is uh, information about subscribing at this location. So the initial information, which comes comes out within about thirty seconds of the FRB detection, uh, has the signal to noise ratio, the dispersion measure, the rough position of about thirty arc minutes, the quality factor, and so on. And this is great for rapid follow up of ground counterparts. Uh, we have been working with the Swift XRT telescope to slew rapidly, but there aren't too many optical telescopes, for example, looking. At these locations, uh, uh, at at this time. So, if anybody is interested, please feel free to let me know, and we can talk about it. The other aspect is the unexplored phase space. So, th these are what I call NSFRBs, not so fast radio bursts. So, this is work led by my uh, postdoc Sujay Mate in TIFR. Uh, what we are searching for are bursts which are not as short as FRBs, but they are still really short bursts. So chime clearly is not very sensitive to bursts that are wider than about 30 milliseconds. And there are a lot of things that are in this phase space of 30 milliseconds to five seconds, scattered FRBs, possible bursts from white dwarfs or M-dwarf flares. And there can also be electromagnetic counterparts of binary neutron star mergers, which are out there, but we would never find them. So we are building a separate pipeline, which would search between 30 milliseconds to five seconds in time scale. So right now we are building a pipeline and an injection system, and we'll be piggybacking on the Chime slow pulsar search, which in itself is piggybacking on the Chime FRB search. So we are a second order piggybacker, but we are hoping to be on sky in the next couple of months. The other aspect which I'm really interested in are, is to find the nearest and the brightest FRBs. Clearly, these are uh, the best uh, candidates to like have optical and X-ray counterparts, and th that is going to lead us to an understanding of FRBs. The farther away FRBs are good as probes and everything, but you really cannot understand much about an FRB which is at a redshift of one. Also, if you have, if you wanted to study counterparts of binary neutron star merger, for example, you cannot get any gravitational wave information unless they are fairly nearby. So the LIGO binary neutron star merger horizon is about 200 megaparsec. So what we need to do is not to go too deep, but we need to go shallow and really wide. We have to cast a very wide net for FRBs. So what we are trying to do uh, in NCRA is to set up this all sky array telescope, which will be an array of open feeds between 400 to 500 megahertz. And uh, you have separate stations separated by about 10 to 30 kilometers. And we'll have an ultra wide field of view about 15,000 square degrees, basically the entire visible sky and have a sensitivity limit of 500 Jansky millisecond. So this plot here shows on the vertical axis, the detection threshold. So farther up is low sensitivity and farther below is very high sensitivity telescopes. On the horizontal axis is the field of view uh, and the size of the symbol tells you the inverse of the localization precision. So a smaller symbol means that you're not localizing very precisely. A large symbol means you have extremely good localization precision. So I've plotted a bunch of existing facilities. Chime is right here. It has a localization precision of about 30 milliarc, 30, 30 arc minutes. Chime outriggers, on the other hand, will have a localization precision of about 50 milliarc seconds. Stair 2 is, uh, as I mentioned, is a very low sensitivity telescope meant for bright FRBs, but it has localization of about a square degree, right? So what we want to do is to have something between these uh, extremes. We want something that has a field of view, which is 75 times larger than Chime and have a sensitivity that is 600 times better than STAIR-2. This should be able to detect one to two ultra bright FRBs per month from our local neighborhood and get sub arc second localizations for all of them. And the, the important part here is that this will have a very large built-in voltage buffer. So it will be able to respond to external triggers from LIGO, or SWIFT, or Daksha, which is a proposed X-ray uh, transient mission, which I'm working on. And with that, we'll be able to take a five-minute snapshot of the entire sky uh, in the uh, whenever we get a trigger. So if LIGO says there was a 
like uh, there was a gravitational wave event somewhere in that direction, we can store the last five minutes of data and try to recreate it from uh, from beam forming. So this is work in progress. The pilot development has started at TFR and NCRA with help from RRI, Asia, uh, Sinica in Taiwan and so on. So that uh, so I'm hoping that in the next few months, I'll be able to give you a better update on this with more uh, with actual hardware on the ground. So let me come to my conclusions and summary. I won't read out all of this because I've gone through it. But if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Thank, thanks, readers. Uh, let me mute myself so that. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions in the chat box. And the very first one is by Reta, which was uh, on like very first slide where you saw the uh, first FRB, where uh, the, 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 you had plotted frequency versus time in, in the very first one where we, you had inspection. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me go back to that. So you, you show intensity there with the color scale, right? And I was just wondering why it's so much like the background, that one. Why right. is the background high before the burst and lower after? Yeah, so that uh, can you hear? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so that happens because uh, it, it, uh, the background estimation was done on a, about 0.9 second time scale in parks, and it had one bit digitizers at that time. So this is archival data from a long time ago, in 2001. And uh, the burst, this burst was so bright that it changed the background estimate. So the background estimate also okay. got higher and it got subtracted. That's why you see the dip. I see. Okay, it's just an artifact. Yeah, it's just an artifact. Thank, thank you very much. So next question is by Vanisha. Can, can you be a new and ask? Okay. Uh, thanks for that great uh, talk. I just wanted to ask, and maybe you'd mentioned this. Um, did are all of the models for FRB emission predicting um, that the radio emission comes first and other wavelengths follow, or is there value potentially in looking ahead of time for, for other emission? Right. So um, there are two aspects. One is that uh, most, most models do expect that you know, the radio and uh, other wavelengths are emitted basically at the same time. Maybe there is a few tens of milliseconds difference between them, but the time scales are fairly short. But the radio uh, waves are dispersed compared to other frequencies. X rays and uh, optical are not dispersed, so radio waves will always come after. So if you wanted to study for uh, study optical counterparts, you probably have to be staring at that location when the radio telescope detects something. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so the, the uh, efforts that we have for, you know, uh, observing with SWIFT, for example, are to look for afterglows. So it is possible that uh, if you have a nearby FRB, then you might expect to see some long lasting afterglow. And that might be true for optical as well. Although the rate of optical transients and X-ray transients in the sky suggests that most FRBs won't have a detectable afterglow. Okay, thank you. So uh, now I would request Kristen. Uh, I can say you have raised hand. Please uh, unmute and ask. Yes, thanks. Uh, hi, Shrihar. Great, great over you. Thanks a lot. Hi, friends. Um, I. Uh, I was quite intrigued by your, your new array uh, that you're going to build, or oh, well, that's proposed. Um, and I, I saw that's also going in the in the in the chain band. So, well, chain frequency is four to five hundred megahertz. So, I was wondering. So, people are going towards the lower frequencies, but what are your thoughts on actually going to higher frequencies? Say, I don't know, C band or similar to uh, to to actually search wild field for firefly bees. Because so far, I mean, we, we've seen R one uh, at at C band with the GBT, but these were always really really pointed, um, you know, follow up observations. But what what are your thoughts on a wild field survey at, at higher frequencies? Yeah, we should we should do a wide field survey at uh, higher frequencies. In fact, one of my colleagues at uh, RRI they have uh, they are proposing a cosmology experiment where uh, uh, it's the epoch of deionization experiment where they need to map a sky, map the entire sky at uh, two to six gigahertz, and so the plan is to have one twenty eight dipoles, 
which have cryogenically cooled, uh, which have cryogenically cooled LNAs. And I would, I am trying to piggyback a FRB search onto it, which would be really cool. But uh, the challenge, of course, at higher frequencies is that uh, dipoles have a much smaller collecting area at, as you go to higher frequencies. And if you put in a, a dish or some reflector, then your field of view is uh, reduced a lot. So there are, of course, challenges to do, doing that. And may, if you start making uh, coherent beams, then you need a lot of you need a lot of them, and so you have to you end up uh, having a much higher budget for the search computing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, te technical aspects aside, but but you you think that you know higher frequencies probably is also a space where one could shoot search, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. There is. Uh, we definitely need to understand uh, FRBs at higher frequencies, especially if you you know if you want to search for uh, FRBs as cosmological probes and you want mm. to find them at redshift three, four, or whatever, then you really need to understand what is the local behavior of FRB sources at higher frequencies and at high luminosities. So go, having a wide field uh, high frequency survey, which would, even, even if it is not very sensitive, would be very useful. Thanks. Hi, David. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? I have, yes. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a comment about um, optical counterparts, um, which, of course, is a, is a tall order for many reasons. But uh, I just wanted to mention that we have this SALT transient program where we follow up on many different types of transients, including radio transients. And we have it, uh, often been requested, particularly by our Australian collaborators uh, to follow up from time to time on, on FRBs. Mostly this has only just led to sort of really characterizing the galaxy that, the, that it's in. But uh, I just wanted to mention that fact that um, we do have a rapid uh, transient follow-up program running on SALT. So that would be an avenue if you wanted to, um, uh, you know, sort of ask for something to be done urgently. Okay. Uh, and I guess your your neighbours across the road at Iuka um, are actually partners in SALT, so they can actually ask for time for this. Um, yeah. Definitely. The other was just a comment um, about where Hyrax fits as, fits into this, because I, I'm, I'm no radio astronomer, but I've heard Harvey Moodley talk about Hyrax and its ability to do FRB signs um, and what you think about that. So yeah, definitely Hyrax is Hyrax also has the same capability. I mean, it, it has basically the same sensitivity as Chime. It has a very large field of view. And it also has it has outriggers already. It has there are plans to build, if I understand correctly, outrigger telescopes all across Africa. And that would be fantastic, of course. Uh, that would give uh, detections equivalent to chime or even better and also it covers a completely different part of the sky so you know you would have uh, a global coverage of uh, frbs right thanks yeah. thanks readers and thanks a lot for everyone actually we need to vacate this room so another meeting is uh, actually scheduled so thanks, Sriyas, uh, for joining us. And it was really very informative talk. Thank you.